لقد كان لكم في رسول الله أسوة حسنة لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيرا بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وآله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Dear brothers and sisters in Islam Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to this new episode of The Role Model coming to you live every weekday at 2 o'clock p.m. Mecca time during the month of Ramadan of 14 44 Hijra. One of the greatest forms of worship that a lot of us don't know of is pondering and contemplation and working your mind and heart, thinking about what's beneficial for you in this life and in the hereafter. This is what energizes your heart. It gives it its energy, the power, and, and the strength to go on. Allah Azza wa Jal praised such form of thinking in the Quran in so many places. Allah says, if we had sent down this Quran upon a mountain, you would have seen it humbled and splitting from fear of Allah. And these examples we present to the people that perhaps they will give thought. The Prophet والسلام, as we all know, lived his, 40, his first 40 years of his life in Mecca. Before becoming a prophet and a messenger, and receiving the revelation, in the beginning, few years before that, he used to sit in seclusion in the cave of Hira, in the Mount of Nur. Doing what? Spending days and nights there, contemplating, pondering, and worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal without a sharia, without any direction, but only following his instinct and his nature. And if you go and look at Mount Nur and at this Gharu Hira, the cave of Hira, you will find that it's about a couple of miles outside of Mecca, surrounded by huge mountains and a clear sky. And this by itself gives you great opportunities to ponder and think. And this, by the way, was done before the Prophet received the revelation, alayhi salatu wasalam. Because after he was made a prophet and a messenger, he never went back to that cave, by the way, ever. Neither did any of his companions or the tabi'een. No one would go and visit that place, let alone take it as a shrine to, to pray to rak'ahs there like so many ignorant people do nowadays. Though this form of seclusion would relieve the Prophet والسلام, from the bad environment Mecca inhabitants used to live in, yet the Prophet only did this for a short period throughout the year, and that was in the month of Ramadan. And the rest of the year he would spend among these people, living like every other person and after he was 
revealed to and became a prophet and a messenger, the Prophet Sallallahu reduced these days into only 10 nights every year. And that was vastly on the last 10 nights of Ramadan, where he used to perform i'tikaf. And i'tikaf is done in the masjid, where it's total seclusion. And this is where the Muslim, especially da'is, who mix with people and meet them and may be affected by such meetings, they need to cleanse their souls every now and then and to re-energize. And this shows you the importance of quality over quantity. It's not what you do throughout the year, how many Muslims accept, how many people accepted Islam, or what are the things you've done. It's your heart that counts because this is what Allah looks at, how pure it is, how clean it is, how filled with iman and tranquility and trust and all these good things that Allah loves. This is all the result of what? Of pondering, contemplating, thinking about Allah Azza wa Jal and His magnificent creations, about what's around you, about the Quran, about the whole world and how things are taking place and how they will materialize in the hereafter and what will happen. The Prophet والسلام, used to ponder a lot. So he used to be silent most of the time, prolonging his thinking and contemplation. Even at night, he used to offer night prayer. He used to offer tahajjud. He used to also contemplate. Abu Dhar, may Allah be pleased with him, said that the Prophet والسلام, prayed night prayer once. And in that prayer, he only recited one single ayah the whole night. And again, quality versus quantity. The whole night you only recite one ayah? Yes. He used to just recite it and repeat it and then make ruku and sujood and complete his prayer and then do that over and over again. What is, what was this ayah? Allah says, what translates to, if you should punish them, indeed, they are your servants. But if you forgive them, indeed, it is you who is the exalted in might and wise. So the Prophet kept on praying to Allah, complimenting Him and praising Him, the Almighty, urging him to forgive and to pardon his servants. Ibn al-Qayyim says, and this was the routine of the Salaf, that they would repeat one single ayah until the break of dawn. And Nawawi says, a lot of the Salaf used to do this, repeating one ayah till the break of dawn. Not only that, sometimes the Prophet ﷺ got emotional when reciting some verses of the Qur'an. Unlike us, we just parrot and repeat the ayahs without contemplating or pondering. The Prophet ﷺ read the verses of the Qur'an with his heart and it had a profound impact upon him. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, may Allah be pleased with him, once said that the Prophet came to me and said, Abdullah, read the Qur'an so I can hear it. Ibn Mas'ud said, O Prophet of Allah, 
You want me to read it? When it was revealed to you, you know it better than me. The prophet said, yes, I like to hear it from someone else. So Ibn Mas'ud, and he was one of the greatest reciters of the companions of the Quran. We were ordered by the prophet to take the Quran from four. Among them is Ubay ibn Ka'ab, Ibn Umm Abd, who is Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Salim Mawla Hudayfa, etc. So he says, I started to recite from the beginning of chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa. Until I reached the 41st ayah of the surah. So I kept on reading until I reached where Allah says, So how will it be when we bring from every nation a witness? And we bring you, O Muhammad, against these people as a witness. And that is on the Day of Judgment. How would it be? So the Prophet ﷺ said to Abdullah, stop there. So I looked at him and his eyes were filled of tears and he was weeping. Reported by Bukhari and Muslim. This is the reaction we need when we read and recite and hear the verses of the Quran. We need it to penetrate our hearts and leave an impact on us when we ponder upon it. Such pondering and contemplation gets you closer and draws you nearer to Allah Azza wa Jal because this is what Allah loves. Some chapters of the Quran made a huge impact on the Prophet ﷺ to the extent that he said once, Hud, Surat Hud, Al-Waqi'ah, Al-Mursalat, Amma Yatasa'aloon, Surat Al-Naba, and Ida Shamsu Kuwirat, Surat Al-Takwir. These surahs have made my hair turn gray. Such surahs included the description, the detailed descriptions of the Day of Judgment. And it was frightening, it still is, to those who ponder and contemplate. So the Prophet said that such description of the Day of Judgment made my hair turn gray because of my reaction to such surahs. Not only that, the Prophet ﷺ used to threaten and warn those who recite the Qur'an and fail to contemplate and ponder upon it. Mother Aisha was asked once, may Allah be pleased with her, to recall some of the things she remembers most of the Prophet ﷺ. She gave it some thought. And then she said, one night, the Prophet ﷺ, while lying next to me, said, O oh, Aisha, leave me so that I can worship Allah Azza wa Jal a little. So Aisha said to him, O oh, Prophet of Allah, you know how much I love to be next to you. Yet I also know how much you love to worship Allah and I'm not going to stand in your way. So you can go and worship Allah. So the Prophet left the bed, made a perfect evolution and stood up in prayer. And he kept on weeping and his tears were running while in his prayer until it wet his lap, then it wet his beard, then it wept, it, it made the earth, the ground underneath him wet from such huge amounts of tears. Then it was time for Fajr prayer. Bilal came and saw the Prophet ﷺ weeping and said, Prophet of Allah, 
Why do you weep when Allah has forgiven your previous sins and the upcoming sins? So the Prophet said, O Bilal, shouldn't I be a grateful servant of Allah when he has given me such blessing and favor? Tonight, verses were revealed to me and these verses, woe and destruction might befall upon those who read them and not contemplate upon them, not give them thought. So the Prophet is warning us if we do read these verses and not contemplate upon them. What are they? These verses are the last verses of Surah Ali Imran. The last 10 verses beginning with, Indeed, in the creation of the heavens and the earth and the alternation of the night and the day are signs for those who, or are signs for those of understanding. Who remember Allah while standing or sitting or lying on their sides and give thought to the creation of the heavens and the earth, saying, Our Lord, you did not create this aimlessly. Exalted are you above such a thing. Then protect us from the punishment of fire. What a beautiful set of ayat. The Prophet وسلم, reacted to such verses and his reaction was illustrated by his weeping, his fear of Allah, his appreciation to such huge and great creation of Allah Azza wa Jal, that the creator of all of this majesty and greatness is the creator of me. And I have so many sins. I have so many shortcomings and flaws, yet I still have this arrogance in me. I still think of myself as something worthwhile. It means that I'm not comparing myself to the environment, to my country, to my continent, to earth, to this solar system we're in, or this galaxy, which contains millions of other solar sisters, so, uh, solar systems, or these millions of galaxies around the world. Who am I to have this arrogance and to refuse to worship Allah, to refuse to pray on time? Who am I to indulge in such filth and sins which Allah abhors and resents? Yet I continue to do them knowing that Allah is watching me and is Allah listening to what I'm listening to. If I don't contemplate upon these things, what will I contemplate upon? We have a short break. Stay tuned and inshallah, we'll be right back. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today I'm going to talk about the book Interactions of the Greatest Leader. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ordered that they be respected and appreciated. An example of that is when he sallallahu alayhi wa sallam prohibited feeding them food that others would not like to eat. Aisha radiallahu anha May Allah be pleased with her, reported that the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was given a dub, a large type of lizard, as a gift, but he did not eat it. So Aisha, may Allah be pleased with her, said, O Messenger of Allah, should I not feed it to the poor? The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam responded, Do not feed them what yourself do not eat. That is a direct application 
of the saying of Allah, which means, O you who believed, spend from the good things which you have earned and from that which we have produced for you from the earth, and do not aim toward the defective therefrom, spending from that while you would not take it yourself, except with closed eyes, and know that Allah is free of need and praiseworthy. Reported by Ahmad, Al-Albani ruled its sound, Hassan, in his book, As-Sahiha. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome back. Our first caller is Um Maymuna from Bangladesh. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. If a woman does ispinja and wudu and after wearing her prayer clothes, she feels some water came out of her vagina and she is certain about that, but she is not certain whether it's from the inner or outer part of her vagina. Since water coming from outer part of vagina isn't impure, only the inner part is, so will, so will her prayer cloth be impure even she is uncertain. And does she have to repeat her prayers when she didn't know the ruling? First of all, such questions are not highly recommended to be aired on public platforms. You can ask this privately, preferably. Second of all, Certainty is not affected by doubt. So if you're certain that something did come out, then this nullifies your wudu. If you're not sure <clears throat> whether it came out or it was already present at the outer uh, uh, surface of one's private part, then this has no impact on your uh, uh, wudu or your salat. And this is why we always say to the people, once you finish urinating and there's nothing coming out all what you have to do is wash your private part which is a stinja and damp the area with water so the whole place is damped with water and sprinkle water on your underwear and move on and don't pay any attention to whatever comes to your mind that something may came out or not because this is shaitan trying to mess up with your head Sumeya from the UK Sumeya? Anna from Uganda. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa ta'ala. My question is if I get a ruling and I start acting upon it and uh, I feel a reduction in my iman, would I be sinful if I stop acting upon it? How would I know? If the ruling is according to Islam, you have no choice whether it raises your iman or lowers your iman. You have to abide by it. So generally speaking, such generic questions without examples, it's difficult to identify. But because it's a generic question, you get a generic answer. If a ruling is part of the Sharia and once you apply it, you feel that your iman is being reduced, you have no choice. A woman says, I just learned that hijab is mandatory, so I'm wearing it. But I feel that I'm intimidated by the people's looks and my prayer is not uh, on time and I, I feel a lot of hardship. So is it best for me to take off the hijab? So the answer is no. Even if your man, iman is reduced, this is reduced due to, due to other factors and not to implementing sharia. This cannot be when you obey Allah and implement the Sharia in your life, this cannot reduce your Iman. This is attributed to something else and Allah knows best. Ahmed from the US. Alaikum <laughs> Salaam wa rahmatullah. So, I had a question regarding, again, I had a question regarding similar to Da'wah. I feel like sometimes in Ramadan or when I'm talking to friends, I try to give them that one day you respond with, oh, I don't, I don't, I feel like I know enough. I don't want you to tell me this or I 
Should I persist in giving them or should I just leave them alone after I tell them once? Ahmed, when people are accepting what you're giving them, this is when you continue to give. When someone tells you to please stop and refrain, you should not pressure them or shove it down their throats. Rather move on and look for someone else who would take your da'wah and accept your call. It is not wise to force people to listen when they don't want to listen. You don't have authority over them. And usually this would backfire. So instead of them getting closer to Allah, starting to practice, they hate what you're preaching them and they hate the people that look like you thinking that everyone who looks like you would be like you trying to shove it down their throat. So no, you have to be wise in giving them or uh, uh, spoon feeding them according to their acceptance. If they are reciprocating and listening, give them a bit more. The moment you feel that they had enough or they're saturated, you stop and give it some times and then a little bit, give them some small dosages until it uh, uh, pays off, inshallah. Suhaib from Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, my question is regarding prayer that when I pray behind an imam and whether it's a silent uh, namaz or a loud namaz, in the first two rakats, I know that the imam reads Surah Fatiha and then he also recites an ayah. And in the third and fourth rakat, he doesn't do that. And I do the same following him. But I have noticed, and it's not regarding one particular imam, whenever I'm praying in the masjid, that they recite Surah Fatiha probably with a much faster pace in the third and fourth rakat because they quickly go into the raku when I'm reciting the Surah Fatiha. So is there any case, uh, is there any ruling that you have to recite Surah Fatiha faster in the third and fourth rakat? The answer is no. The Fatiha's pace is the same in all four rakats. So if you're praying dhuhr, the speed of which you recite the Fatiha as an imam or an individual or a follower is the same in all four rakahs. Unfortunately, <clears throat> a lot of those who lead the prayers don't have knowledge. And a very essential part of knowledge for the imam is to be aware of those praying behind him. So even if you recite the Fatiha, and most likely you will recite it in a fast fashion, you have to pay attention that behind you, there are those who find it difficult to read it as fast as you. They have problems with pronunciation. So if you recite it in an X given amount of seconds, you should add more seconds to that just for those behind you so that they would not be rushed into cutting their Fatiha and then their prayer is invalid because you did not give them time to recite the Fatiha. Unfortunately, the vast majority of those people who lead prayers, especially in small masjids, don't have knowledge. So, so they just re re read the Fatiha, I mean Allah Akbar, not paying attention to the Fatiha, to how it should be recited, to how they should contemplate, and our episode is about pondering, contemplating up, uh, uh, on verses of the Quran. How did the Prophet ﷺ react to such uh, uh, verses? These people don't. All what they care about is how many rak'ahs they're uh, concluding, how many verses of the Quran they have read, especially in taraweeh, if they finish the Quran during Ramadan or not. And this is not the right thing to do. Salma. Uh, Salma from the UK. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. 
Um, I apologize for asking this question many times, but I don't know um, a good way to give the girl who's like intimidating to actually give the money back because I could just text her and ask her for her card details and um, send her the money. But then I get, uh, I feel like it would make things worse. So I don't really know like an actual good way to give her money. I wouldn't know either. How do you think I would know? This is your life. This is your neighbor. This is your car. So this is something, again, there are so many things, and I've, I do encounter a lot of similar questions where people want to be spoon-fed. So, Sheikh, what happens if this happens? The answer is so and so. Okay, what if something like this happens? And, and they keep on cascading so many things. And this is not normal. The people are overthinking issues, exaggerating and inflating it so where a small grain of sand becomes as big as a mountain in their heads. And this is a huge sign of OCD. And this is how shaitan messes up with your head. You should not expect the sheikh to tell you, okay, sheikh, um, I don't know how to give them their money back. And I don't have their uh, bank account. Do I have to say to you, go and ask them? Uh, if I ask them, Sheikh, I don't know, should I transfer it in UK pounds or dollars? Or can I use PayPal? And uh, PayPal may take some um, uh, commission from me or from them. Oh, and they keep on asking over. It's like a snowball. It's becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. You have to find out for yourself. You have to apply your logic. You have to put yourself in their shoes and ask, okay, if something similar to this happened to me, how would have I wanted them to react? And what would my response be? And so on. Diane from Emirates. Assalamu alaikum wa Sheikh. How are you? I'm fine. Alaikum assalam wa barakatuh. Thank you. Uh, so Sheikh, my question was regarding the daily azkar. Is it okay for you to say, uh, to say them when you're walking? And if you feel like you didn't say them with the uh, right mindset, is it okay for you to like repeat them or you should abstain from doing that? Okay, first of all, you're entitled to one question. But because it's Ramadan, we have a bonus and a discount and a sale. We will tolerate this only for you. You can say your adhkar best when you're sitting in the masjid where you had concluded your prayer because you get double rewards. The angels will be praying for you. But if you had some important errands you want to go to, there's no problem in leaving the masjid, saying your adhkar while walking, while driving, while doing whatever you want. It still counts. Do I have to repeat the adhkar if I was not mindful? The answer is no. Because this opens the gates for shaitan to introduce OCD. And you'll end up repeating prayers, repeating wudu, repeating the shahada. And all of this is not part of Islam. And Allah knows best. Salman from India. Assalamu alaikum, Shaykh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. How are you? I'm doing great, alhamdulillah. Shaykh, I know the hadith uh, that we don't need to go to extreme while rinsing nose in wudu while fasting. So I inhaled water very slowly and carefully in wudu, but I mistakenly swallowed it. Now, I am not sure if water went inside my throat or not, but I am inclined that it may have got inside. So should I add this fasting after eat, uh, considering the fact that I have OCD and waswas in almost all Islamic practices, but Alhamdulillah, I'm better now. The answer is no. Your fast is valid. The restriction not to exaggerate while inhaling the water up your nostrils and blowing it out as for the hadith of Laqeet ibn Sabura, may Allah be pleased with him. This is to not fall in such a mistake, but if you have done such a thing and you swallowed water, this was unintentional. So no one says that your fasting is 
invalid because it is unintentional. Therefore, continue your fasting without a problem, but try to be more careful next time. Munib from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, during uh, prayer, if um, something is going on with our life uh, and we feel in need and, you know, and we contemplate uh, on Fatiha and other Azkar and Quran we read and we become emotional and cry, not necessarily out of like fear or love, love of Allah, but like the re realization that he's the only one who can resolve all these issues. Does this impact the validity of uh, the prayer? No, this has no impact on the validity of your prayer. Your prayer is valid. We have only one Allah to worship and he's the only one who can solve our problems. So expressing your emotions while in prayer, as long as this does not take you out of the form of the prayer, then there's no problem in such weeping and Allah knows best. Udma from India. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hope you're doing well, Sheikh. Barakallahu feekum. Barakallahu feekum. Uh, Sheikh, a mufti shared a hadith somewhere and it is uh, translated in, in English as uh, the Prophet sallallahu said, O oh, Ummah, by the one who sent me with truth, Allah does not accept the sadqa of a person whose relatives are in need, yet he gives it to others. And by the one who is in charge of my soul, Allah would not look at such a person with mercy on the day of judgment. If this is sahih hadith, is a person sinful for not giving the needy relatives? And does he need to repay if zakat is invalid? To my, to my knowledge, there is no such authentic hadith. We know if you give your zakat money or your charity to your next of kin who are in need, you'll be getting double the reward. But there is nothing in Sharia that says that if I decide to give it to a stranger who's in need while depriving my own kinship or relative that it would not be accepted and I would be tormented for that. There is nothing in, as such in the Sharia to my knowledge and Allah Azza wa knows best. Tavinda from India. Assalamu alaikum Sheikh. Alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Uh, so my question is, in my family, women wear almost covered clothing, salwar kameez. However, they don't wear abaya. I have been making their dresses for years. Now, through a question I asked on your website, I realized that I'll be sinful, same as their sin, if they don't wear abaya. Now, I don't want to make their clothes or even wash or iron or buy their dresses because I don't want to be uh, sinful. But as I live with them, and I have to do this and also want to do, do this out of love and to seek reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for being good with them. I'm stuck and many waswasas are coming to my mind. What should I do in this situation? Are you asking about preparing and washing their clothes so that they can pray in it or to go out with it? To go out in it. Okay. So basically speaking, the act of cleaning and washing, drying, and pressing clothes is a good thing. Now, whether they use this in haram or not, this is not your responsibility. Because if we try to cascade this, we will fall into great hardship. Your sister asks for a glass of water and you give her a glass of water and then shaitan says, if you give her a glass of water, that will clear her throat. And you know that in half an hour, she's going to speak to her boyfriend on the phone or uh, gives, give a song in a karaoke bar uh, late at night. And that would help her clear her throat. So don't give her water. Nobody says this. So washing your clo their clothes, cleaning their houses, preparing their food is a good deed and this is separate to what they're going to do with these things afterwards. So there is nothing wrong in you doing that, insha'Allah, azza wa jal. 
Suleyha from India. Hello, Assalamu alaikum, Sheikh. Wa alaikum wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, my mom wants to buy gold ring and wear it in index finger. And in that ring, it, its name is written as Allah's name. So is it permissible? First of all, women, according to the most authentic opinion, are exempted from the prohibition of wearing rings in these two fingers. According to the hadith, narrated by Ali ibn Abi Talib, may Allah be pleased with him. And the hadith is in Sahih al-Imam Muslim, in the chapter dealing with adornments and uh, um, clothes. The Prophet prohibited us from wearing rings in the index finger and in the middle finger. So the scholars said that this is specifically for men. Others say, yes, it's for all, both men and women. But the most authentic opinion is that women are not excluded from adorning themselves in whatever finger they wish. So it is restricted to men. Secondly, wearing a ring with the name of Allah is permissible. The Prophet's seal, which was a ring, had the writings engraved on it, Muhammad, Rasul, Allah. So the name of Allah was there. The name of Muhammad was there. And some of the Salaf used to write in, in, or engrave reminders on their rings. This is permissible, but we have to be uh, careful not to enter the toilet with such an engravement or such a ring. Like the Prophet, whenever he went والسلام, to answer the call of nature, he used to take off his ring. So we should do this aim. <clears throat> Is it recommended? I personally believe that one should not do that because usually when you wear a ring with only Allah's name engraved on it, what is the purpose? Most likely, you would think that this is a form of protection and to bring good to you. And this by itself is a minor shirk that can mount to major shirk. So you should refrain from that if you have such an intention and Allah knows best. Al Haji from India. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Sir, so with regards to certain players, uh, is there any restriction on the purpose of travel? Like, uh, can I certain my players when I'm just going for a college program in another state? And say, we have some foreign students. One, here one, one question, excuse me. So, what, what is your question, Haji? When you want to go to your college, which is in another state, is there any reason or ruling on Qasr prayer? Is this what you're asking about? Starting in prayers, when I'm going to another state for a program, a college program in another state, can I sort in my prayers? Okay. Uh, do you live there or just once in a, a year you go? No, once, just once. Okay. Uh, so, yes, the, the answer is, of course, whenever you travel, out of your city limit to another city or to another town, and the people consider this is a traveling distance, maybe 100 kilometers or more. In this case, you're entitled to shorten and combine the four rak'ah prayers of Asr, uh, Dhuhr, Asr, and Isha. You can combine Dhuhr to Asr or Asr to Dhuhr, and you can combine Maghrib to Isha or Isha to Maghrib while shortening it, and pray Fajr on time as it is. Until you go back to your hometown, and this is a concession from Allah Azza wa Jal. Amin from the U.S. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as wa rahmatullah. Sheikh, my question is, if I lay on something that has the name of Allah, like a uh, kitab or maybe like my phone, is this considered kufr by accident if I lay on it? First of all, we have to distinguish between the intention. When I lie, and I'll give you an example. This happens a lot in masjids. And now it's happening less often than before because of my white beard. 
I am considered to be among the senior citizens. Before, when it was a little bit uh, black, less gray, people would come and, you know, bombard me with complaints. What are you doing? This is disrespectful. This is this. The elderly. Now they can't do this because, oops, <laughs> I'm the same boat. So whenever I am sitting to a pillar of the masjid and I'm extending my feet, they used to come and say, oh, this is disrespectful. You shouldn't do this. This is blasphemous. Why? You're extending your feet to the qibla and you're disrespectful, respecting Allah. Do you know what's in my heart? How dare you say such, such a thing? When I'm reciting from the Quran and I place it on the ground to perform sujood at tilawa, somebody picks it up. And I said, excuse me, it's my, my Quran. I said, yeah, yeah, I was just honoring it from the ground. He said, why would you do that? Oh, this is disrespectful. This can't be kufr. So says who? I'm putting my forehead on the ground. Is this kufr as well? The issue is, what is your intention when you extend your feet or place the Quran on the ground? Or you lie on a book? Or a, your mobile, of course, has nothing. You can lie on your mobile if you are not afraid of cracking it. There's no problem in that. The Quran is locked and closed and it's not there, it's only codes. So is there any form of intention to disrespect the Quran? Definitely not. Do you want to humiliate the Quran or the Qibla? Definitely not. Then don't listen to these uh, people because they don't know what they're saying and what you've done has nothing to do with Kufr. Um, the last caller for today is Razdul from India. Assalamu alaikum, Sikh. Assalamualaikum. So, Sikh, my question is, is it permissible to apply perfumes that contains alcohol and will our prayers be valid if we pray after applying it? Jazakallah. So, basically speaking, we've answered this before. Perfumes that have alcohol are totally prohibited to drink because this intoxicates you. The Sheikh, who would drink it? So you tell me. Applying it externally is totally permissible. Oh, but it contains alcohol. So what? I'm not drinking it. Don't I use sanitizers? Before I take my shot, don't I use alcohol uh, uh, swaps, I think they call it, or waps or whatever? There's nothing wrong in using alcohol externally whether in perfume or in your clothes or in your body, there is no problem in that, none whatsoever, but don't drink it. This is all the time we have until we meet same time tomorrow. I leave you fi amanillah. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهَ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ لمن كان يرجو الله واليوم الآخر وذكر الله كثيراً